So uh, it's time to get out your little uh, cameras that make phone calls again and uh, do some questions here. And then we're going to uh, pose the questions to our, our panelists. And if you have a question directed to a particular panelist, then go ahead and put their name up there somewhere so we can see what that is. And I don't know if we anticipated how we were going to do this without a wireless mic, but we're going to do the best we can with what we got. So let's see what kind of questions are coming in here. And uh, what is the uptake of living shorelines by contractors, builders, developers? Are they starting to use this kind of thing as new homes are built on the shoreline and homes are retrofitted, as happens so much for people to tear down the old homes and build new ones? A lot of development on the shoreline, sir. So, so I'm thinking, Armando, that might be going to you, man. Yes. Um, well, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, this fact has been uh, developed by a course for marine contractors to move into training and have to do more living shoreline. So I'm not going to say that everybody's on board, but there's a lot of people getting into all, into this, you know, going more natural habitats. Oh, thank you. I'm not going to show the mic. Um, moving to more natural habitats, using more native plants. So, yes, so there's been a uh, suite. We need to see more of that. So, but yeah, it, it is happening. And there's resources for people. Uh, developers, marine contractors as well, people doing the maintenance as well, the monitoring and all these problems, so yes. Okay, here's a question, uh, and this could anyone who wants to jump into it. What partnerships surprised you the most in your projects? What was your unexpected success? Uh, county staff. You know, typically when you work with uh, government staff, it's all top down. Here's, here's the program. You know, you got to fill out the forms and so forth. Uh, they came to us and say, what do you need? How can we help? We, I think we really kind of changed the color, the culture. It was in stormwater uh, area. Stormwater in Sarasota County has $17 million a year to spend, and they have changed their culture. They want to help. They're out there, folks. Uh, we have eight, we did a mile and a half of restoration, 150,000 data plants. And now there are only 789 miles left, <laughs> many of which are in your neighborhood. So uh, why do you think we go to communities where the river walks are all hard and shoreline, just like seawall to seawall? What's up with that? We know it wasn't like that at the very beginning. Why is it like that now? I think we haven't really changed the, our, our mental image of what is attractive and what's easy to maintain. And so I think the challenge, while we are making some progress with contractors, perhaps with training and so on, I don't think we've, we've as individuals and as property owners, come to the realization that this too, a living shoreline with plants is beautiful. You know, an awful lot of people think of those as weeds. And I think we need to change what we consider beautiful. And I also think there's a misconception of what is good for you and will protect you. When you see the big wall, concrete wall, think, people think that, that that's going to protect my property better than a bunch of plants. And it's all the way around. So I think it's misconception and also just domino effect. Somebody put a seawall and seawalls, um, in some cases you need them, and I'm not gonna say seawalls are totally bad. In some cases you have to have a seawall because of the proper you are. But most cases you don't, and seawalls actually enhance erosion and transfer it to the people next door. So when you see a seawall, it's a domino effect. You see then another one and another one. So again, it's just lack of understanding and misconceptions. Thank you, Armando. Hey, Harrison. Um, you know, you talked about this all starting in the neighborhood. So uh, anybody, uh, maybe you have an idea or somebody else, how many neighborhoods in Sarasota County have shorelines where they could go out and do a project like you did in South Dallas? Uh, well, we have five and a half miles of shoreline along uh, Lemon Bay. Uh, and there's many mi more miles, you know, the experts are here on Sarasota and Sarasota Bay. But let me just say this about Lemon Bay. There's been over a billion dollars spent on cleaning up Sarasota and Little Sarasota Bay over the last 50 years. There's been almost nothing spent on Lemon Bay. We need to focus on that. Right, so now we've got to figure out what those gaps are, these places in between. And something to remember is that we're all connected to the watershed. We're all connected to the Gulf. So even if I don't live on the short one, I impact what's happening in the water. So even if I'm far removed, that water will eventually make it to the Gulf. So 
changes in landscape, even if you don't have frontline proper uh, waterfront property, you make you can make big changes as well. Anybody involved youth in your restoration efforts, your cleanup efforts, your shoreline stuff? Are youth engaged in this? Okay, I see all the heads nodding and Bob. We're a pretty old community. <laughs> You're young at heart. Though. We had 25 people who planted two, 3,000 plants and nobody was under 65. You're young at heart, man. Uh, we, we've had Girl Scouts and other young people, uh, kids of, or family members and so forth. Melissa, a question for you. How long did it take you to become such an awesome drone pilot? Uh -huh. How many years have I been flying? Um, it, it, it took, like I said, six months before my hands stopped shaking. But um, legally, when you fly a drone, what you guys don't know is you always have to have your drone in visual line of sight. You can only fly it with 400 feet up in the air legally. Um, and uh, my drone can go up to, I've gotten, got it going up to 50 miles per hour. But the key is, is you have to keep that drone in your line of sight and see what your, your flying. So, you know, the camera's my eyes and it gets turned around. So whichever way the camera's facing is forward. Um, but I, I've captured a lot of amazing stuff. And when you talk about restoration, I just want to give you all kudos up here for, you know, talking about, you know, fertilizer is bad and the native habitats and, and you know, what the work we're doing in the community. Um, I know that the red tide was a big thing. And the one thing that you guys didn't see that I saw up in the sky was how big of an effect we had, how that's going to affect our ecosystem. And um, just, the, I got to go out there and see the little fish that died that you guys didn't see, that didn't wash up, that went down to the bottom. It was just, it was devastating, you know? And, it, and it, it, every little bit, any little thing that you guys can do matters. And you know, there's blackout periods for fertilizer. So just get educated, you know, and, and read up on, water quality and just simple practices, and I think that that's the best advice I could give. <laughs> hey Armando, since you got the mic, uh, do you think a vertical oyster garden is filled? Do you see that as filled? Uh, yeah, a, a vertical oyster garden, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm thinking that they're thinking of like along a seawall. Uh, you know, Jack talked about how the state and the county laws in the city prohibit you. Do you see that as filled or do you see that as something else? No, I, I think that's a good idea. I mean, uh, in oysters, we lose a lot of oyster beds and critical organism for us in terms of water quality. They can, one oyster can come up to like $50 per day. So, talking about improving your water quality. So, if you can do that as well, and we have resources, we have information about how can you do that as well in terms of permitting. There might be some difficulties, but you can get in there. So, yeah, so I see that's something that people can do to enhance their seawalls, definitely. Yeah, and this other question kind of relates to that. And uh, why are the city and the county averse to adding things to preserve shorelines like natural shell and stuff when gosh, the entire bayfront Sarasota was, uh, you know, backfill from dredging out of the bay? Hey, I'll, I'll take that first. Um, you know, I think that um, governments have become averse because of all that dredging fill to um, approving any type of fill for fear that it will be misused and um, developers might say that I'm building a restoration project when indeed they're, they're actually trying to fill more land or to, uh, to remove uh, mangroves and so forth. So I think that's part of the challenge is that uh, we, we have a legitimate concern about what constitutes um, proper use of things like um, like fill. All right, we're going to do one more question. Um, since um, you know the astronauts up in the International Space Station uh, clean up after their pets, how come we can't get dog owners around here to clean up after their pets? I just spent 20 minutes cleaning up after pets last night uh, in our the Grove. And uh, I want to invite you all to the after party at the Grove at 5 o'clock when the, the uh, Florida water stewards are coming by. And uh, come, up, come out and visit us. We're at Seminole and Quincy in South Venice. And you'll get to see what we've done uh, with the native plants. And our, we have over uh, 80 native plants planted there as well. Okay. 
All right, let's have a big hand for all of our